John Batchelor, Malcolm Homeline Conference of Presidents is here. I told you there are too many villains in too little time. We need to get race back to Hamas. Hamas of Gaza. Within these last hours, headlines in Israel. You can go to the Jerusalem Post and the Times of Israel. Five IDF soldiers are wounded in a mortarous strike by Hamas and its gangsters out of Gaza while they were going about their business closing down a tunnel, another smuggling tunnel. We welcome Jonathan Shanzer. Jonathan is the author of a new book, and the book I have in my hands right now, in addition to being the Vice President for Research at the FTD, Foundation for the Defense of Democracy, his book, Yasser Arafat, Mahmoud Abbas, and the Unmaking of the Palestinian State, we go immediately to Gaza. Jonathan, I'm glad you're here because these events, I mentioned that we spoke to our colleague Dennis Ross of the Washington Institute, and he pointed to the fact that this is a provocation and an escalation. Can we anticipate that the IDF will now move into Gaza, not just to silence the mortar attack, but also to deal with what looks to be a deliberate dare of the IDF by wounding these soldiers? Good evening to you, Jonathan. Good evening. Uh, yes, we're watching this right now, and, and uh, I think that uh, this is a surprising escalation. Um, we, what we found out is, uh, at least thus far, the Israelis have uh, released the fact that, that they did send ground troops into Gaza, which is not a regular occurrence, uh, and the purpose was to destroy a smuggling tunnel that, came, uh, that went right into the western Negev, uh, the, the, uh, the southern desert in Israel. And uh, the goal was to simply destroy the tunnels. And um, as these soldiers were going about their business, they were attacked by mortar. Five were wounded. The Israelis apparently responded back with tank fire, killing at least one uh, Izzedine al-Qassam member, a Hamas operative, possibly two. And now uh, we continue to hear reports of Israeli drones circling overhead in Gaza, ground troops uh, still in Gaza and airstrikes as well, uh, and even a few naval bombardments, as I understand, from the Mediterranean. So this looks uh, like it could possibly turn into uh, a wider war. Right now, uh, this is one night's battle. And, and you would assume that it's coordinated with the Egyptians, who also sent drones over Gaza and have been warning them that they would take military action uh, against, uh, against Hamas. Right. Uh, I think that's right, uh, that uh, obviously the Egyptians have been um, going about their, uh, the business of destroying these tunnels. They've done, I think, uh, a, a, a tremendous job over the last several months, uh, and they've continued to do it even after the United States announced that, they were going to be, that we were going to be uh, cutting back on aid. There were questions, at least initially, of whether the Egyptians would continue this, but they see this uh, as their national interest, uh, as do the Israelis. And so one gets the sense that uh, the walls may be closing in on Hamas. The only thing that I would point out here is that Hamas has been trying to court new uh, patrons. We know that they have been in a lot of trouble of late. Uh, you know, the Egyptians, obviously, or the Muslim Brotherhood is no longer assisting. We have, we've been hearing that perhaps Qatar is, is dialing back on the aid. Right, it's, uh, back. it's unclear whether the Turks feel emboldened enough to be able to continue to provide that assistance. And so the Hamas uh, leadership uh, went hat in hand trying to get Iran um, to, to get back on board and to provide those hundreds of millions of dollars that Hamas had relied on for many years. The only way that Hamas would be able to get back in the good graces of Iran would be an attack like this. And they, uh, and they, they also... That they were interested in, in war with the Israelis to, to get that kind of patronage back. And they also tried to get back in the good graces of Assad, who threw him out because that was one of the reasons why the Iranians broke. Uh, but, but let me ask you, in terms of the negotiations that are going on now, <clears throat> and the core of your, the thesis of your book, given the instability and the, the, lack, the lack of a political culture that really uh, allows for the kind of, of governance that would, would enable the government to negotiate a deal, can they really come to any kind of a serious negotiation with a conclusion? Not just to be able to negotiate a deal, but can they actually implement it? You were talking about pa the Palestinians the Palestinians, and the Israelis. With the Israelis. Right. right, and, and my, my thesis is that, you know, that there's no way uh, that we continue to, to turn a blind eye to uh, abuses within society, which means that the Palestinian government is not respected by its own people. It, it barely represents its own people at this point. 
uh, and the Israelis would be cutting a deal with a government that is, or a leader now, that is four years past the end of his term, uh, and that certainly wouldn't represent his own people. And, and I think, by the way, it, Abbas, as I think you indicated, uh, is not interested in making this deal. I think he, right now, he's holding on for dear life. I think he wants to remain the leader of the Palestinians until he dies, and I think he enjoys this dynamic right now, which is a people that are unhappy with the Israelis. He can continue to blame the Israelis for everything, even as he makes his own people miserable. I want to underline something I've heard you say, but I want to summarize. The mortaring of IDF soldiers while they were conducting their business to seal a smuggling tunnel is a provocation that looks to be uh, a way of encouraging Iran and other gangsters to pour more money into the hands of Hamas. But the Israeli response right now, the ships offshore, the ground troops, the drones in preparation for airstrikes, do you believe that that is what Hamas intends? In other words, this provocation, do they know they're going to get hit hard? Is the calculation that the IDF will only, only stay for 48 or 96 hours, then back off, and the money comes in? Is that all correct, Jonathan? Well, that is typically what happens. Right. I mean, in some cases, even after a provocation like this, Israel doesn't even respond. I mean, you have to remember that thousands of rockets and mortars have been fired out of Gaza into Israeli airspace. But five IDF soldiers, and we don't know their condition, but that's right. significant for an army as small as Israel's. And that is significant, and that was a red line that was crossed. And, and now the assumption is, is that the Israelis will carry out some larger operation that I do not believe that Hamas is... And working. has Hamas miscalculated, Mr. Shanzer? That is what I believe. I believe that they did not understand what they were what they were drawing Israel into, and now they're going to have to pay the price. The Prime remember. Minister today, uh, in a speech about the uh, anniversary of Yom Kippur, pointed to the fact that he believes sanctions are working against Iran, and if they stay, Iran will surrender their nuclear weapons. You're pointing to a larger story, a larger matrix, which is that Iran can be encouraged to pour weapons and money into the region, to continue to. Uh, devil Israel, not just with the nuclear threat, but also with the gangsters of Gaza, the West Bank, they're all competing. Well, uh, so, therefore, the sanctions regime isn't everything, right, Jonathan? The sanctions regime is not going to turn Iran off from pouring money into the men who fired those mortars today. That's going to require, what, troops on the ground? Sweep them out? Uh, occupation of Gaza? What is to be done, Jonathan? Well, uh, let, me, let me try to address some of this. First of all, I mean, the idea that, san that, that sanctions will stop everything is absolutely wrong. And the idea that right now we know, for example, that Secretary Kerry was on uh, Capitol Hill today trying to get the Senate to not impose new sanctions. And, you know, the idea of giving sanctions relief right now to Iran before they have relinquished that nuclear program and before they have given assurances that they're going to stop sponsoring groups like Hezbollah and Hamas is insane. Uh, we need to keep the pressure on. That is, we're dealing with uh, the world's number one state sponsor of terror. It's not just the nuclear program. It is a broader uh, strategy that Iran has deployed to destabilize the region and to, to begin to, uh, to, to, to close in on the Israelis from Lebanon, from Gaza, from, from all around the region. And so this is why it's incredibly important to keep that pressure up uh, and to make sure that real concessions are drawn by, by Iran. And Malcolm, Ma Jonathan's making a point that I want to press to you, that it is uh, what you would say convenient and lawyerly of the White House to claim that the sanction regime will be successful for the nuclear wep suspect nuclear weapons program when what's going on in Gaza right now is a direct outgrowth of the Tehran regime. Well, also, the sanctions haven't worked, didn't work in uh, the Syrian cases uh, as well. Uh, I was wondering, Jonathan, whether you've seen then consequences in terms of escalation in in, uh, Sinai. We hear that Al-Qaeda is, is uh, activating more of its cells there, trying to take over, uh, tying directly into Gaza. Could we expect out of this an escalation in the Sinai as well against Egypt and perhaps against Israel? 
Absolutely. Uh, one of my colleagues uh, at FTD, David Barnett, has been doing a study into Ansar Bait al Maqdis, which is one of the Salafi jihadi groups. And we know that, that the Egyptian military has, has cracked down, but we also have, have identified the fact that while the, the frequency of attacks have dropped, the attacks themselves are more spectacular and bloody in nature. And I suspect that there are links uh, to Iran. Iran, of course, has been um, the provider of weapons and the pipeline uh, for many years to, uh, to the Sinai Peninsula. And so I suspect that we'll see an uptick of attacks there as well. This is all part of a strategy. And, and I think it's important to note here that we know that there are al-Qaeda-Iran links. We don't know all of them. It's a very murky picture. But this is something that the 9-11 Commission uh, pointed out years ago, Mm -hmm. and the intelligence community has not done enough, I think, to inform the public of this, but we know that those ties exist. State of Failure, Jonathan Shanzer's new book. I look forward to talking to him at length in future. The subtitle, Yasser Arafat, the dead Egyptian national in a parking lot somewhere on the West Bank. And his underwear is clean. Mahmoud Abbas of Damascus, once upon a time elected president of the Palestinian Authority. And the unmaking of the Palestinian state. Right now, there's incomplete information. Five IDF soldiers wounded, a provocation. Jonathan Shanzer says a major provocation. Elements of the Israeli Navy, the Israeli Air Force, and the Israeli Defense Forces moving around Gaza right now. This will not be pretty. Malcolm Holmline, Conference of Presidents. I'm John Batchelor.